My name is Ram Das, and I would like to introduce you to a very special friend of mine named Emmanuel. The quality of Emmanuel is that he has a certain courtliness, a certain charm, a certain warmth, and a certain humor that has made me treasure him as a friend. The interesting thing about Emmanuel, as one of my friends, is that he doesn't have a body in the conventional sense that you and I think of as embodied beings. Emmanuel um, speaks to us through a woman named Pat Rodegast. And what you're going to see today are a series of sessions in which Pat reports to us what Emmanuel is saying. Uh, you will see, as I saw, that Pat is in no way possessed by Emmanuel. In fact, she seems more like an intimate friend of his. But as a psychologist, of course, I have to ask myself the question, is Emmanuel really another being, or is it another part, perhaps a deeper unconscious part of Pat's personality, and that this is really a, an inner dialogue of Pat with another part of herself? And I've decided, finally, that it really doesn't matter because the truth and the intuitive validity of what Emmanuel says is in the last analysis what really matters. And whether that information is coming from a deeper part of Pat, or from another being, or from the highest one that lies behind all forms, doesn't matter as long as it helps guide us home. Emmanuel says to us, whether or not we should trust what he says, finally, the final arbiter must be our own intuitive heart. It gives me great pleasure to invite you to join with me in receiving my friend Emmanuel. To those who have not experienced a conversation with a spirit or anyone who is walking around unclothed in human form, I would simply say that this is nothing to be frightened of, nothing even to pay undue attention to. There is more to the universe than can possibly be conceived of by the human brain. And rather than to spend your lives limiting yourself to the capacity of logic and reason, I would say utilize this as a wondrous opportunity to spread your wings and fly. What you experience as you hear is your experience and you must honor it. But experience and thought are two different things. I could introduce myself and say I am a being of light. I have walked the earth before as you have. I am no longer required by the willingness of my soul to move into human form that I know now perfect love and that I reach to you in the name of that perfect love. I could say that. But unless you are willing to step beyond the confines of your intellect, you will not hear it. And so I say to you, rather than to attempt to understand who I am, allow whatever experience comes to you to be honored. And if the experience will say, I do not believe in spirit, all well and good. Regardless of what it is you believe is speaking, allow yourself to hear what is said. Allow yourself the experience for that, my very dears, is the only purpose for which I come. I do not come to represent myself. I am you. And therefore I come to offer you to you in the name of love. When I'm speaking for Emmanuel, I am always aware of what I'm, what he's saying. I hear him. I hear him like, uh, like you hear him. And what I'm aware of is not censoring at all, but having a responsibility 
to be as clear as I can be in my truth so that my personality, my hang-ups, my whatever it is that my agendas don't get in the way. My experience is not at all that I have been removed and that another consciousness has come in. That is not my experience at all. What it is is that I have expanded and um, that I have touched, I've touched the greater reality that's always there. So when I say I've left room, maybe what I should say is that I have uh, opened up um, to receive the greater reality of which Emmanuel's a part. Yeah. But I'm not possessed. I don't feel that there's anything invading me at all. I mean, it's just me saying, yes, okay, and then I move out. There are those of you who would have me answer questions of a very personal and a very human nature. There are those of you who believe that you would be most blessed if I would say to you why tomorrow at noon you must walk three paces down, turn around, and you will meet your everlasting love. And if you take three more paces and turn to the right, you will find the perfect career for you and you will be abundantly wealthy. Unfortunately, if I were to say that to you, it would, in intent, divert you from the treasures that you were really seeking, which is not the how-to of human experience. Human experience of and by itself does not hold such mystery. Though there are times of forgetting, it seems so that it does. But the purpose of human life is not to win or lose. The purpose of human experience is to learn who you are. Each circumstance in your life, in your world, has been, been created by you to offer you, the human being, and you, the soul, within that body, the opportunity to look around and say, what is this about? And what can I learn from this? And why have I allowed it to come into my life? And why have I perceived it as I have? And why do I, do I react to it as I do? Everything without exception in your human world is an educational tool. And fear, fear the tyrant, the proclaimed master of the planet. Now there is a professor. For fear says to every iota of love as it begins to remember itself, how dare you? I will give you logic, reason, why at this very moment, if you allow yourself to be, you stand on the brink of destruction. And so in human terms and through the human vocabulary of various religions, there became a personification of this tyrant, and it's been called the devil, Satan being of darkness, prince of night. All it is is fear. Fear given shape and form like every other concept in your human world. Why you yourselves, in your individuality, in your, in your personalities, are simply your own idea given form. Why if you would allow yourselves to step outside of fear just for a moment, your life would appear to you as it truly is a wondrous adventure. Excitement, delight, creation. But because fear is the shroud within which you wrap yourselves and your entire society approves of that, for instance, nothing is too bad to be true. 
and most things are too good to be true. Or so it is said. So the viewpoint you see is that darkness, badness, disappointment, illness are the norms of a human experience and the abundance, the dance, the delight is something aberrant at best, an illusion most of the time. Why when you were small children I dare say is there is not one of you who was not at some time when you were in your child's freedom and delight chided for being too noisy, too inappropriate, too foolish, to whatever it was that the vocabulary in your family utilized to express their fear of your delight. And am I saying that your parents were monsters? Of course not. But they were and are imperfect human beings. And they did and do walk with their own fear. And nothing frightens fear so much than to perceive a human being without any. For fear then is thrown a challenge that it is not used to. For the world honors fear. So what is the task for all of you? To recognize that at every given moment of your life, you have not only the right, the authority, but the responsibility, and I say that word lovingly, to perceive where there is fear and where there is love, and to choose love. You have holy work to do, all of you, but it involves not one other person. Initially, it involves yourself. Until you can know your own holiness, you cannot honor another. Until you can love yourself, you cannot love another. What is the indicator that you are truly in love with who you are is that you are allowing your life to be what you want it to be. Allowing, not forcing, allowing. That is all that is necessary. The moment that you recognize that you are worthy of the Garden of Eden, it will be there. And you are worthy, and so is everyone else. But that is not your concern. You cannot push people into the Garden of Eden from the outside. You can only, from the inside, open the gate and invite them. So you must get there first. It's not so far. It's waiting inside you in the sanctuary. It's the voice of that very small child that says, I remember who I am. We each have an agenda that we have, that we brought into each incarnation. And this isn't my own knowing, this is Emmanuel's teaching now. I, uh, I don't know that, but I feel that it's true within me. And that what we're responsible for then is to find where our own negativity is, where our own no to life is, where our own fear is. Emmanuel says we have two choices, love or fear. And where in our life we're not choosing love, but where we're choosing fear. And what subtle is, and what requires vigilance is, that fear walks around looking like love a lot of times, uh, that we do things and we don't know our motivation. We don't know our motivation. We just assume, because we want to assume, that it's loving and it's not. And so that's where our responsibility as human beings is to go underneath the surface, underneath the obvious. And where we find the anger, where we find the fear, then not to stamp on it, but to embrace it and say yes to it like Emmanuel says and to bring it out and to see what it's saying and to transform it. Um, Emmanuel has said that the only reason we're here is to learn to love ourselves 
And the only way to love yourself is to find out all that's inside of you and, and embrace it, not permit it, but embrace it. It's a whole different thing. Before we begin, I want to remind you that there is nothing in your human world that, requiring, that requires such sobriety. Your entire world, and I say this most gently, is not to be taken so seriously. Though the world may appear to be heart-rending and at times filled with suffering, and I do not mock your human condition, yet I can no longer stand in it. And I want to offer you this recognition that however it is you perceive your life to be, whatever your human experience consists of, know without a shadow of a doubt that beyond this entire experience, there is love, there is rest, there is infinite safety, and there are all those whom you believed you would never see again. That your world is safe because it is illusion. That you do not begin and end with birth and death. This is merely an experience, an episode, if you will, in the soul's process. And there is nothing to be tense about, nothing to be concerned about. I urge you to deeply enjoy whatever it is you are experiencing in your lives. And I do not say that one must then dismiss difficulty, for difficulty is a teaching. But to know that difficulty is a teaching will allow you the freedom to be joyous. Very well, with your permission, we will begin the questioning. Could you please give me some guidance on how to stay more in the now? Uh, my mind wanders a lot, and I've worked on this a long time. And also, how to bring much more joy and lightheartedness into my daily life. He's saying, my very dear, it's one and the same question. For living in the now guarantees joy and happiness. There, you never thought you'd hear me say a thing like that. I generally speak in such a morphism that I dare say you all become quite impatient at times. To remain in the now is to believe that you are absolutely safe. In the belief that you are absolutely safe, there is no other place for you to go. There is no need to recall history. There is no need to project into the future. I offer this as an exercise at this moment. Again, for all of you, of course, close your eyes and go within. Open your hearts to receive what I am about to say and make the decision to believe me just for this time. You are held in the hands of God and you are absolutely safe. As you absorb that truth, your mind quiets and there is nothing but this moment. And then as your mind begins to move again, the moment is gone. Now I do not mean that in the now you do not think, of course you do. But you think from the now. You do not think into distraction for fear 
takes you away into other times and other places. Fear will not let you rest. Fear will not let you stay in the now. It cannot, you see. Its very life depends upon that. For the moment that fear allows you to experience the moment of now, fear has no more reality. And it must die. And because, and I move a bit away from your question, but I believe it is necessary, because the child within each one of you was taught that fear is what kept you safe, then there is fear of releasing fear. And so the decision must be made clearly, minute by minute, until it becomes your natural state. And that is to say when your mind is distracted, I know I am absolutely safe. And the mind will say, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. And you will say again, I know, I may not think, but I know that I am absolutely safe. Use that as a mantra over and over even when you are in moments of distress and your mind is racing and your world is demanding of you that you direct your attention to what seems to be a crisis or an emergency if you will remain as well with that mantra you will eventually know how to be in the now and how also to be in your world and you will be joyous. I'd like to ask a question a minute for someone else. I want so much to be more loving, yet I can't seem to will it to be so. I want to not have all of the angry, anger, nasty thoughts that pass through my mind, yet I can't seem to will it to be so. What shall I do? What you shall do is to cease the willing and embrace the anger. To be loving must mean to be loving to self. It can never mean to be loving to other until you are loving to self. To say to yourself, you must not be angry you must not be unloving. How can you then love? It is commanding the heart to open. Hearts do not open on command. It is instructing the child to behave. And the child is attempting to behave. But when one says to the child, be loving, that is impossible. One can say to the child, act loving. And all of you know how to do that. And that is where the difference is and that is why it is so difficult for you. You are saying, be loving. You cannot. Not until you say to yourself with all the love that you possess, it's all right for me not to be loving. I will love myself in my unlovingness. To say that and to truly mean it will open your heart. But to demand that you be or become, that is not a loving thing to do to yourself. Can you not see that these feelings of unlovingness stand upon your history, stand upon your pain. These feelings of unlovingness are your protectors, or so it had seemed to the child. 
The child said, no, I will not be loving. I will not love. Good for the child. If a child believes it must love on command, much is lost. The child's integrity is lost. The child's capacity to know itself is lost. There is nothing but a puppet. And that is not a human being. That is not a God. Love yourself in your unwillingness to love. And go back in your history to find the very young you. And sit with that young you. And hold dialogue. And ask that young you, why do you not want to be loving? And allow the answer to come you will find deep respect for yourself. And the moment that that takes place, you will be loving. A lot of people ask me, uh, did I have psychic experiences as a kid? And from the viewpoint of a child, I think all children have psychic experiences. Um, I, so I would say, no. I mean, nothing exceptional. I believed in fairies, I believed in God, I believed in love, all kids do. Um, I was aware of when my parents weren't in their loving truth. All kids are. Um, so no, there's nothing, there was nothing special. I had no uh, vision. I, I went through a childhood like everybody else does. And I believe that everybody is entitled to the connection with the world of spirit, because that's who we are. And I don't think anybody deserves to walk through a lifetime without that, um, without that love that's there or that assurance. I think, I don't know why it was that um, I moved into the space of saying yes, that I want that. Um, somewhere I did, even before I knew what it was that I wanted. Somewhere I knew that there was more to life than just getting up to going to work and like that. And so there was a moment in fact when I, I remember standing in my kitchen and uh, saying, it's gotta be more than this. And I didn't say it from despair, I said it from a sense of, okay, I've got that down. And, and now what else is there to life? And that's when this began to open. So I don't think there's any special magic and I don't think there's any special dispensation. In fact, I know there isn't, it's just, I was ready. Manuel, from your perspective, what happens to us after death? And since I'm writing a book on death, and if you had only one thing as guidance to give people searching out this subject, what would it be that you would tell them? Thank you. One thing that I would tell them? That there is no such thing. Does that cancel out your book? <laughs> ah, but the illusion of dying, what a professor that one is. For you walk through your days dreading that moment that is inevitable from the moment of conception you are going to die. That is not a terrible thing to say to you. That is simply as uneventful as saying, tomorrow the sun will come up. Perhaps less eventful. For there is a very slim chance that the sun won't. There is no chance at all that you will in any manner not survive your death. So perhaps the second thing I would say is, it is absolutely guaranteed that you will survive your dying. That you will walk through the door of that illusion and you will recognize it, it will be so familiar to you. For you have died so many times before. Some of you know this, some of you don't. 
but trust your memories. And as you all move towards that moment of dying, look around, don't close your eyes in fear. Look around and you will begin to see things very familiar. Just as when you have been away on a journey and you begin to move towards home and as you get closer and closer to your own home, things become very familiar. The streets, the trees, the houses, the people. And you come home to the world of spirit with that excitement as well. For it's first the relief that yes, finally I have decided I'm going to die, I have accepted this, I am not going to fight death any longer, I have been fighting it all my life. And now I'm going to say yes, the final yes, yes, I'm going to die. The moment that you do that, the moment that you truly love yourself enough to say it's all right, it's all right, I'm going to let myself die, I will love myself anyway. At that moment, the burden, the yoke of responsibility to avoid death at all costs is lifted from you. And what a lightness. And as you move through the doorway, as you expand beyond your body, is what it really is. You will touch such familiar love so many people will come to greet you, not just those you have lost, as you say, in this particular lifetime, but you have had many lifetimes. Have you any idea how many people you have loved and who have loved you? Countless. And they are all dear and they are all remembered to you, whether they have reincarnated and are walking with you now. In your human world, the greater portion of them, remember, abides in the oneness. Knowing what death is, I can't imagine why you all not running to it now. Except that you know and you have faith that the work that you have come to do is valuable and therefore you remain. And that, my dears, is the truth. If the soul did not believe in the commitment that brought it back to this planet, who would remain? Beautiful as your planet is, it is, you must admit, a very demanding schoolroom. Okay. Good evening, Emmanuel. I'd like to know if there are any limits to your knowledge. That is, what sort of questions can you not answer um, and also, do you, you yourself have uh, a spirit guide or a mentor or a teacher? He said, very interesting question. I believe I have not been asked that before. Therefore, I must respond, is there any question that I do not have the answer to? My answer to that must be, I don't know. <laughs> I have not been asked all the questions yet. Do I have a mentor? Indeed I do. And it is the same mentor that you have. It is myself. And as I move into the greater expansion of my own being, I recognize my vastness, my holiness, my divinity, my loving. And yet, even in the complete remembering of the oneness in which I now choose to abide I cannot remain still for I am creation and you are creation and we must move and create for that is our nature so there is never a time when you in your consciousness or I in mine will sit and say there now We've, we have done of it. For always and ever, life, consciousness, love continues. Uh, as I understand it, there, this um, receiving guidance from the world of spirits, a two-way street. 
that we can sit and be given wonderful, wonderful insight and be bathed in that wonderful love which happens when Emmanuel's around. Um, and I'm sure other spirits too, though I haven't experienced that. But then what happens is we're required to take what we're given and to put it through our own filter system to see what is right for us at that moment and what isn't to set it aside. Uh, we're not required to obey. I think that's real important. We are being taught. We are not puppets. We're not being dictated to. But we're being given information. We're being given loving wisdom. And what we do with it is our responsibility. So when people would come to Emmanuel for readings, there would be absolutely no prediction. There would be no how-tos beyond certain suggestions that they certainly had within themselves to begin with. Um, Emmanuel says he stirs the embers of our own remembering. And that's all anybody can do. Nobody can give us what we're not. Nobody can tell us to do what isn't organically right for us in the name of truth. I mean, people do, but not in the name of loving truth. So to receive what a spirit gives isn't the final answer. It's not the key to a happy life. It's um, something to receive. And then to say, how do I utilize it in the name of my own commitment to my own loving truth and who I really am and what I need. It, ultimately, we are the authority. Ultimately, we're the final responsibility. Nobody's going to take that away from us. And we, we not only should we not want to give it away, but that final authority and final responsibility is, um, is our state of grace almost. And we shouldn't let anybody take it away. Dear Emmanuel, it seems like having a child puts such stress on a couple. Problems seem to often appear at that time. Why is this? What can be done to help it? The infant comes to teach you the meaning of love, the meaning of saying yes, even at three o'clock in the morning when you're not feeling well. If you are willing to learn from that child what that child can teach you, it will affect your relationship most positively. For the child is saying, this is the joy of saying yes. Can you not then, having learned to say yes to your child, learn to say the same yes to your mate? If you are willing to do so, unconditional yes, you will not be taken advantage of, you will not be destroyed, you will not in any manner poison your lives. You will set yourselves free. For to say yes does not mean yes in servitude. It means yes in love. It is quite a different matter. If one says yes in servitude, one is not saying yes at all. One is saying, I'll obey you because I have to. And I may even pretend to love you, but I'll get even. I will withhold my love. But if one says yes in love, one says yes in the loving of self, in the celebration of saying yes, and in the embracing of the other who has shared with you in this miracle of creation, this small, unconditional loving tyrant. <laughs> This wondrous teacher comes to us to teach us how we do not love ourselves and therefore we do not love each other, but we must love this teacher and that is the teaching. How you respond to your child in the name of love is exactly the capacity you own to respond in love, then turn to look at each other and ask why do we not respond to each other in this way? if we have such a capacity to love. And that is where disturbance come and pains come. For one knows beneath the mind 
one perceives the other, the mate, giving this loving attention to the child, and one knows they do not receive that. And what does one do? Well, one does not stamp about the house or sulk or weep, but one begins to say, isn't that interesting? I wonder what I am not giving to them that they are not giving to me. And let us utilize this infant, this child, as the focal point for our capacity to love. And in so giving to that child in love, let us hold that experience and turn to face each other and say, I give to you in this manner now, or where do I not? And be willing to walk into those frightening places where you must confront your own unwillingness to love, but not negatively. But as you would see within the infant, it's unwillingness to compromise, it's unwillingness or incapacity to love as you would like it to love you. For instance, to sleep through the night. And yet you love, and yet you love, and yet you love. Can you not give that to your mate? And in so doing, what a wonderful, wonderful temple to love you will build together. How can there be so much evil in the world? What can we do to help? You can primarily begin by offering yourself another word, another definition. Or when one says evil, immediately, whatever it is you are addressing is cast outside your heart. Outside your heart, nothing can be done. So bring this consciousness back and let us rename it more accurately. Why is there so much forgetting in the world? Why is there so much blindness and deafness? So much heartache? So much unexpressed and unfulfilled longing? Why is there so much fear? Verbalize that way. The answer is clearer, is it not? To love, to love, to love. And when someone says evil, I urge you not to close your heart in terror. For such a concept as evil belongs in the vocabulary of fear, not in the vocabulary of love. In the vocabulary of love, the very same thing is a lost child. Is someone in the dark looking to find their way home. What to do? Become the loving teacher. Be who you are in as much love as you possess, as you have allowed yourself to remember. And be that loving, remembering human being within the company of the forgetter. And that is all and they will see your light when they are ready and they will hear you when they can and pray for them some people have asked me uh, you know how do you know it's a manual how do I know it's a manual and I think my response is you don't there's a there's a sense of when you're in the presence of a manual there's a there definitely is a feeling that um, people experience, a feeling of being seen and being loved. Um, that is the healing. That's the healing that takes place. That's the instruction, teaching that takes place. But whether it comes from a spirit or whether it, whether I'm smarter than I have any right to think I am or it doesn't matter. Whatever is heard that is useful and loving, it really doesn't matter where it comes from. You know, you can walk down the street or sit in the subway and you can overhear a conversation that could change your life. And you can say, well, that was a spirit sitting there and it was meant to be and, you know, they just came for me in that subway. Yeah, maybe. Or you could say, uh, I was tuned at that point to hear truth. 
And in that tuning, I heard it wherever it was. So I think it really goes back to the commitment of each individual to find loving truth. And I think when we're open to it, a loving truth comes. I am unemployed and have been looking for a job unsuccessfully for several months. I realize I am responsible for my situation. However, I am sad and becoming discouraged and disenchanted with life. I'm having difficulty maintaining the love feeling. Can you give me advice? Two months of unemployment and you have already moved to despair. My dear, can you not see how close to despair you have always been? And it is not that you are employed or unemployed that is irrelevant. Oh, I know, I know. One believes one must have a certain amount of money in so that one can have a certain amount of money out so that one can somehow maintain oneself. I know, I know, I remember that. And at the same time, there is a learning opportunity here that is if you will forgive me, priceless. <laughs> and that is, that was terrible. <laughs> I'll go back to him. <laughs> and that is to recognize your despair and not give it the labeling of because you haven't found a job. Do not be afraid of your despair. It will not hurt you. It is only the voice of the small lost child that is finally waiting to be heard. So do not run from it. Take this honored time when you are not occupied to sit with yourself in beauty and in love and offer the despair within you the gentle, understanding ear that it never had when you were young. This is very important. Allow it to take place. What do I do with the yearning to be done with this life and back in the loving place we come from? <coughs> Why you walk with it, you live with it, you sleep with it, you eat with it, and you ask yourself a thousand times a day, what's so terrible about this that I want to be done with it? And when you find something that seems to stand before you clearly and say, well, I'm the reason, I'm terrible, this is why you want to go home, you have found your teacher for that day. For you will not leave this schoolroom until you love it. And you will not love it until you love yourself. And you will not love yourself until you allow these aspects that you have judged as negative and unlovable to come before you and to be seen by you in the name of loving truth and to be embraced by you back into the oneness of who you are. When you say, I want to be done with this place. Why? Ask yourself that and be explicit. I offer this as homework to every one of you, even those who do not believe they are want to be done with this world, there is something you want to be done with. Even if it's just this day or the ride home in the rain. Utilize everything in your life as a learning tool for well, that is exactly what it is never never be content with the intellect's response for the intellect is so quick to file and to label you will lose your life you will avoid the experience of living if you allow your mind to lead you. For the mind says so quickly, this is good and this is bad. There's enough bad, let's go home. Where have you been? 
Begin to look at what is undesirable. Now, mind you, please do not mishear me. I am not saying, even though you don't want to, you must love everything. Heavens, no. But allow yourself to understand why you do not love it at a deep feeling level, and then give yourself loving permission not to love it. All of your unlovingness is because you have said no to yourself in some manner. All your pain in your life is because you have not allowed yourself to be who you are. You have been taught this, but you are all now old enough, mature enough to begin to challenge what you were given as the guidelines for human living. Begin to question. Do not take for granted or accept anything that is not love. One thing a day, dear ones, that you do not love, bring it into your attention and lovingly examine it. Be aware of yourself as you pursue this wisdom and say yes to yourself every inch of the way. And I dare say, by the time we meet again, you will have transformed a great deal of unloving and what am I doing here into, isn't this wonderful? I think the world is becoming a Garden of Eden. Something delightful happened um, about six months ago. I don't know what Emmanuel has in mind when I do a workshop. I am at this point now where I am not even able to get a hint of what the theme is going to be or the subject matter and how it's going to be given. And at one workshop, he said, it was Saturday evening and everyone was tired and they worked very hard all day. And he said, and now I'm going to tell you a bedtime story. And the result was, it was so dear. All these adults who had been working deeply on their issues suddenly became children. And they said, oh good, and they all lay down on the floor. And um, Emmanuel began. And his, his telling of the story felt to me like a healing of the wounds of separation between the child and the adult. That the bedtime story is a story of comfort to the child and of teaching to the adult and of healing to everybody. Once upon a no time, there was a wonderful spirit named Alice. Now you beings who have decided in this lifetime to represent your masculine aspect, do not feel slighted. You too were Alice. What's in a name? In this realm where Alice lived, there was no room for fear, no need for pretense, no requirement for definition beyond the delight of the moment. In the Bible, it's called the Garden of Eden. To we in spirit, it's called home. To you, within your human consciousness, it's called, oh, that's ridiculous. Alice was a being of incredible curiosity, not unlike many of you. And through the millennia of exploration moving from now to now, there awakened a curiosity to explore what now was beyond itself. And so plans were made and advice was both given and received and there were many farewell parties and much good wishes. And finally, the moment came when Alice was to embark upon her adventure of discovery. Now remember, this is a bedtime story. And of course, there is a part of Alice that never left home, that recognized that oneness was really all there was. Alice put on her pair of wings made especially for adventure and she soared through the heavens until she came to an opening that quite puzzled her. For there, it seemed, the world of familiarity ended, and right before her was a vast opening through which, for a moment, she hesitated to go. 
For she thought that if she were to move into that other land, she might not remember how to return home. Alice turned back for a last look homeward, and then she leapt with the greatest enthusiasm into the vast unknown. As she drifted through the velvet sky, she said right out loud in the middle of the universe, once upon a time, time? What a wonderful idea. If there is time, there must be a place where I can experience it. For time and place go together, of course. And as she continued to drift, listening to the song of each star, wondering what it was like on that planet or this one, she came upon a very soft and gentle breeze that seemed to pick her up and carry her in the tenderest of care to a place where there was a very shining and beautiful circle of light. The circle of light began to pulsate towards her. She watched with extreme interest as the light seemed to reach out and fade back, reach out and fade back. And Alice, having been attuned to listening very carefully to the song of flowers and to the melody of rainbows, could hear a faint voice coming from this planet. And as she moved closer and closer to it, she began to hear sounds quite unfamiliar. Sounds of eagles clamoring for attention, and a sound which quite confused and upset her, the sound of weeping. She said, I don't remember that. What does that mean, that strange melody? When Alice got close enough to see where all these unfamiliar sounds were coming from, she saw beings that were just like herself, except that they were all wearing rather dense and heavy costumes and were apparently unable to see anything of lighter matter because when she waved, no one waved back. So she decided that she would put aside her wings for a little while and take on a costume herself to join the others. So Alice chose two people to be born to, since this was the way to get into a costume. As Alice stood at the doorway of her birth, she saw lots of other spirits waiting for costumes too. She was most surprised and excited to see that the part of herself that she had left at home had come to visit her. And that part said to Alice, we in the oneness who love you will remember you. We will never leave you. You will not remember us except in the depths of your being. And oh yes, your wings, wings never rust. They will always fit you regardless of how big you think you've grown. So Alice took off her wings and with great courage, she was born. The first thing Alice did was to look for pockets in her costume where she could stuff the memory of home. And because her costume seemed to have no pockets at all, she thought, very well, then I will tuck it in my heart. And so saying, she turned her attentions to the adventure of the moment. Now it was not carelessness that caused Alice to forget, nor was it a lack of loving. It was simply that time and space had taken on a new dimension, as it always does when one comes from the remembering and suddenly finds oneself in limited clothing. And so it isn't surprising that she soon found herself not remembering who she was and looking into the eyes of other people and not being able to see beyond their costumes. Sadly, the more Alice forgot, the more room there was for fear to come in. Alice tried to get away from fear by always being loving and kind to others. But it was of no avail. Fear would not leave her alone. And Alice said, whenever I feel afraid, I feel as though I've forgotten something. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I just feel as though something very precious, very sweet and dear has gone from my memory. And just then, Alice heard a whisper, and the curtains blew gently open and in came an angel of light, the part of Alice that had never left home. Alice recognized her right away and said to her, I will prove to you that having left the oneness, I have grown. I have accomplished, I'm ready to come home now. And the response was the tenderest of questions. Alice, will you let us love you? That is the question that you have traveled through eons to hear and to respond to. 
only to be reminded, dear Alice, that I know who you are. And all I have ever wanted from you is permission to love you. That is the question that is always being asked of you by love wherever it is found. By the kiss of a warm puppy, by the blooming of a flower. And so there was a wonderful magic moment when Alice said, Yes, I will let you love me. I will put myself clearly on the altar of faith and I will say to you and to you and to the light and the oneness of all, Yes, yes I will. And so saying, the two became one again and she put on her wings and went home. There have been times when all, since all this began, where I have felt so grateful and so filled when I can step out of just the experiencing of it where it becomes what I do today, you know, and take an overview. It's astounding. And one of those times I was being open and grateful and full, and I said to the world of spirit, I said, what do you want me to do? I mean, why, why, why is all this here? What do you want me to do? And I heard Emmanuel clearly say, you are to teach the gospel of unknowing, the walk of faith. And at that point, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But um, now I think that what I am doing in my life is living the gospel of unknowing and walking the walk of faith. And this not knowing where I'm going to live, not knowing what Emmanuel is going to say in a workshop, not knowing anything, and being willing just to die into the next moment of my human experience has become for me my ultimate aim. Because when I am in this moment, when I am in the now, I am full, I am safe, I'm joyous, there's nothing I want, everything is there. And then when I step out, when fear calls me out from the center, which it does frequently, then I get into all my head trips again about how to be safe, what should I do, I need to know, plan, structure, and all that. But when I'm in the now, uh, I absolutely know this is the only place I'm alive, it's the only place I'm real. So my task in this life is to walk the walk of faith. Uh -huh.